Have you brought with you uh, some of those devices which would have enabled the CIA to use this poison for... We have indeed. For killing people? The round thing at the top is obviously the sight. It works by electricity. There's a battery in the handle and it sh fires a small dart. And the dart itself, when it strikes the, the, the uh, target, um, does the uh, target know that he's, about, that he's been hit and about to die? A special one was developed which potentially would be able to uh, enter the target without perception. As a murder instrument, that's about as efficient as you can get, isn't it? It, it, it is a weapon, a very serious weapon. I first uh, began working in intelligence uh, while I was in the Army in Germany during the Cold War years. Later, when I was a student at Penn State, I was uh, recruited by the CIA. The guy told me he was from DOD, Department of Defense. Uh, we were recruited, or uh, believing that we were being recruited by DOD. It wasn't until we got to Washington that we found out it was CIA. Uh, however, the day just before we left for Washington, we were sent a telegram that read something like, uh, your uh, employment with the DOD will involve assignment to CIA. And we didn't even know what CIA meant at the time. Didn't even know what the initials stood for. A secret organization is a risk in any society. I believe it's a risk that we must take for the net gain, because I believe it's always going to be there. Now, let's say that we abolish the CIA. It's done so many bad things. Let's don't ever have this kind of intelligence organization again. Do you know what's going to happen? American presidents are strong-willed men. They wouldn't be in that office if they weren't. If they don't have an intelligence service, they're going to create their own. It may not be very big, and they may reach into the loony bin to find the people to run it. And they may call it the plumbers, but they will have it. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Japan has today surrendered. The last of our enemies is laid low. Now, back to New York. People who have seen Times Square celebrations before declare that this is the biggest uh, spectacle in New York history. Estimates of the crowd go beyond a half million. We just fought a war, and in a war you conduct all sorts of operations, the uh, deception operations, uh, behind the lines activity, sabotage, all the rest of it. Uh, and I was involved in that, and the OSS was involved in that. We demobilized all our military forces at the end of 1945 and stripped our Navy and Army and Air Force. The Soviet forces were not demobilized. As the danger of Stalin's expansion, uh, that kind of, uh, of uh, society seemed to be threatening to sweep around and uh, cover more of the world. People were very concerned that they were faced with a new totalitarianism. It was the same as the Hitler one, but under new management. And consequently, we developed a CIA in order to conduct the subversive level of the struggle. The great burning question at the end of the war was how the United States was going to avert a return to the great unemployment of the Depression period of the 1930s. During the last phase of the war, production in the United States was double what it had been in its best pre-war year. And this exceedingly high production had been achieved with 10 million men under arms. There was only one way that the return to the unemployment of the Depression could be averted, and that was by creating foreign markets for our overproduction. This was the economic rationale behind the Marshall Plan and the reconstruction of the economy of Europe. 
we are following a definite and clear foreign policy. That policy has been, is now, and shall be to assist free men and free nations to recover from the devastation of war. We could choose the course of inaction. We could wait until depression caught up with us. Our other course is to take timely and forthright action. Preparing for the special session of Congress, the Foreign Policy Committee of Senate and House hears Secretary of State Marshall tell what's needed to give the free nations of Europe economic support. I recommend that you give immediate and urgent consideration to a bill authorizing the appropriation of sufficient funds to provide the supplies necessary to permit the people of these countries to continue to eat, to work, and to survive the winter. We find ourselves, our nation, in a world position of vast responsibility. We can act for our own good by acting for the world's good. The CIA comes into this because the political forces in Western Europe after World War II uh, that were prevailing had been the backbone of the resistance to fascism and they were the left-wing political parties, principally the communist parties, uh, especially in France and Italy. These parties, knowing that the reconstruction of their economies would uh, bring economic and political dependence on the United States, opposed the Marshall Plan. And the CIA was partly set up in order to combat, um, on a political warfare basis, the efforts by left-wing political organizations in Europe to uh, impede the success of the Marshall Plan. Signing the bill that will enable our national military establishment to do more coordinating and less pulling in opposite directions, President Truman uses a number of pens. These, in turn, are passed out as souvenirs to the witnesses, one of whom is the boss of the armed forces, Secretary of Defense Johnson. The CIA was set up to first to collect intelligence and to analyze intelligence, to centralize intelligence, to get it all together so it could be all looked at together in the best academic tradition. Uh, also, however, it was set up in order to struggle at that subversive level with the subversive forces that we faced. The CIA from the very beginning, at least as early as 1951, has used the information that it has collected and it has used the information in order to penetrate and to manipulate the institutions of power in whatever country it is operating in order to influence the course of events in those countries. And essentially this uh, boils down to propping up those forces which are considered to be the friendly forces and in penetrating, dividing, weakening and ultimately destroying those forces which are considered to be the enemy forces. <laughs> The Italian election campaign at the crisis. Premier de Gasperi calls for votes to defend freedom and beat communism. And he champions America's Marshall Plan. Communist leader Togliatti in Rome hurls pro-Soviet, anti-American propaganda at an election campaign gathering of Italian Reds. To combat the communist peril in the Italian election, the Pontiff of Rome repeatedly urges the people to vote against the Reds. I think that whenever we had the choice, we tried to support center democratic forces. I mean, that clearly that's what we did in Europe. Uh, we didn't support any fascist groups in Europe. We didn't have to because there were good socialists, good Christian Democrats. We did not go to the right-wing forces. I joined CIA in September 1951. Uh, the preceding year, uh, April 1950, NSC 68, was drawn up. Uh, it was a joint interagency working paper. Uh, it was inspired primarily by Dean Acheson, and it was the blueprint for the Cold War. It is not only the threat of direct military attack which must be considered, 
but also that of conquest by default, by pressure, by persuasion, by subversion, by neutralism, by all the paraphernalia of indirect aggression which the communist movement has used. It was the height of the Cold War. Senator McCarthy, Joe McCarthy, was terrorizing the nation with charges of a great internal communist conspiracy. The State Department, according to him, you will remember, those of you who are old enough, was filled with Soviet spies. Main Street, USA, at peace, unaware that a cabal of conspirators plots its enslavement. At Mossonet, Wisconsin, two former communists show how a highly organized minority, using the seizure techniques taught in Moscow, can take over a city. First, the mayor is hustled off to jail, and then the chief of police. In the Red Primer, an early lesson teaches the importance of controlling law enforcement. Without a controlled press, red tyranny could not survive, so the town's newspaper editor, who is likely to be independent, is quickly seized to adorn a concentration camp. Prepared propaganda speedily rolls from the once free presses, and the picture on the front page tells one and all who gets allegiance from now on. The official name of the government established by the revolution shall be known as the United Soviet States of America, USSA affiliated with the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics, of which Moscow is the capital of the worldwide communist superstate. The concept was that the Soviet Union was engaged in a worldwide effort to obtain domination everywhere. Well, the question is, uh, the machinery that was set up as a result of our experience in a hot war adequate to deal with what may well be a 25, 10, 25, or a 50-year struggle in the Cold War. The problems presented are entirely different. I think the Russians are counting on a lack of staying power on the part of our country. I think they feel that uh, we're sort of fat, rich, and slap happy, and we don't have uh, the staying power and the patience to put up with a long-term struggle. We have passed through a time of the awakening of people to the nature of the true danger in the world. We are now deep in a period of action. The institutions of power which are um, penetrated and attempts are made to manipulate them are the political parties, the security services, the military institutions, the trade union organizations especially, the youth and student movements, cultural organizations, professional societies, and in a very big way, the public information media. We need powerful radio stations abroad, operated without governmental restrictions, to tell in vivid and convincing form about the decency and essential fairness of democracy. The crusade for freedom will provide for the expansion of Radio Free Europe into a network of stations. They will be given the simplest, clearest charter in the world. Tell the truth. Radio Liberty was funded entirely with CIA funds, I think, from the very beginning up until uh, 1971 and 1972. Radio Free Europe was supported in part by the Crusade for Freedom and later the Radio Free Europe Fund. These carry more than the message of freedom. They give specific instructions to the Russian people how to work for their liberation with maximum effectiveness and minimum danger under the very noses of the Soviet secret police. To achieve a truly free Russia, your allies behind the Iron Curtain need your help. They need moral support and your material aid. No one really knew that it was funded by CIA. When I say no one, obviously, some persons did. I'm not sure when I personally found out. It was fairly early. But uh, at that time, I think we took the position, which most Europeans do now, that uh, national intelligence is uh, part of the whole foreign policy, or for that matter, domestic policy of any country. And uh, uh, support for CIA during the 1950s was certainly considered patriotic. The film industry signs up in the campaign to help answer communist lies. Mr. Cecil B. DeMille says, Signing the Freedom Scroll today will cost you less than a minute of your time. 
Let it be your firm commitment to this warfare for the minds of men that this world under God shall have a new birth of freedom. One of the principal mechanisms which the CIA used after World War II um, in its programs to influence the course of events in different countries was the uh, use of front organizations. For example, in the youth field, the CIA set up the World Assembly of Youth, which continues today with its headquarters in Brussels. In the student field, the CIA set up the Coordinating Secretariat of National Unions of Students. The operation runs in a very simple way. Most people will join an outfit because their friends belong or because, they, well, I guess it's a good idea that I belong to it. But only a few people ever bother to go to the meetings, and these people, of course, always end up as uh, executive officers. Of course, executive officers control all these organizations, and this was the technique that was used by uh, Cordmeyer and his uh, division in youth organizations and in uh, women's organizations uh, and other uh, such groups. In the trade union field, the CIA founded or helped to found the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions with its headquarters in Brussels, which continues to exist today. My first job at CIA was case officer for French uh, left operation, non-communist left. And it was then that I was case officer for uh, labor operations in France. And Irving Brown was then um, receiving money from us, which he was passing around in France. At St. Paul, AF of L President William Green, center, and Dick Walsh, left, theatrical labor leader, hear Irving Brown give a first-hand report on the value of American motion pictures abroad. I have just returned from Europe, where as the representative of the American Federation of Labor for over four years, I have had the chance to see the terrific impact that the American movies are having on the peoples abroad particularly those behind the Iron Curtain. This places a great responsibility upon the American people and the American motion picture industry. I, uh, as the European director of the CIO, had some concept of what it costs to provide technical assistance to trade unions in Europe. And I know on the very modest budget which the CIO could afford in those days, I could not possibly be a match for one Irving Brown, who was dispensing funds on a basis that uh, very early uh, began to raise doubts in my mind whether these funds were truly AFL funds. In 1947, during a general strike, the communist unions were about to take over France. Competent observers feared that there would be a fall of the government, and the French people were hungry. Many of them took to the streets. It was that, at that time that David Dubinsky's International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union went to the aid of a free French unions. J. Lovestone and Irving Brown, working for Dubinsky, gave money to a new union called the Force Ouvrière. Of course, labor unions cost a lot of money, and in those days, France was paralyzed. So when they ran out of money, they came to the Central Intelligence Agency. Those people were doing a great job, and we were very glad to help them. New Premier Schumann strives to deal with a wave of strikes. Coal mines are tied up, communist-controlled unions calling the workers out and stopping fuel production as winter comes. A general transport strike stopping the shipment of fuel and food in a country cold and hungry. Strikes are the communist tactic as the Marshall Plan develops economic aid to support freedom in France. The American program bitterly opposed by communists. The early days of the Marshall Plan when there were some political strikes called by communist trade union forces and perhaps uh, communist political elements to try to defeat the Marshall Plan, to try to block uh, foreign aid from being unloaded. It became a matter of breaking these strikes. And um, the U.S. government, through central intelligence, uh, 
called upon Irving Brown and Jay Lovestone to try to organize a counter move. And of course, uh, if you want to break a strike, uh, you go to boys who have big bare knuckles and who know how to wield the cudgeons. And they turn to uh, what can best be described as uh, the Corsican Mafia under the leadership of a uh, uh, well-known uh, Corsican uh, racketeer by the name of Ferry Pisani, who became uh, really uh, a paid agent of central intelligence and collaborated with Irving Brown and Lovestone in their operation to break the strikes. In about 1953, I terminated funds for Ferry Pisani. Of course, Brown did not like this, but uh, there was nothing for Ferry Pisani to do at that time and probably he was involved in smuggling uh, heroin going through Marseille and uh, he didn't need our money. During the executive board meeting of the ICFTU, I was acting labor attache and I was escort officer for Mr. and Mrs. George Meany and uh, Mr. Meany's secretary, Virginia Tejas. On the last evening of their stay in Brussels, as I was driving Mr. Meany, Mrs. Meany, and Mr. Meany's secretary back to the Metropole Hotel, we got into discussion about European labor and international labor. And um, perhaps it was unfair of me to go into this kind of dialogue with George Meany because he did not know that I was working for CIA and that I had once been Washington case officer for Irving Brown's labor projects in France. I was the one who set his budget and cut his budget. Um, so it was, it, it was unfair, perhaps from that uh, point of view, uh, but I did take him on and I gave him uh, my views on how unpopular Irving Brown was and as a consequence how much damage he was doing free labor and discrediting people that he associated with because he had the reputation. I knew it was deserved of being a big money bag man for CIA. Meany didn't know how to quite cope with this uh, except to explain to me that there were some things I did not know about. These were precisely the things that I knew everything about. The American Federation of Labor during my time as Secretary Treasurer and as President, and the AFL CIO during my time as President, has never received any CIA money for any activity, either directly or indirectly. That applies to Irving Brown as well. What's that? that, that yes, Brown. that applies to Irving Brown as well. When you've come through a devastating war, as the European countries did, and people literally were pulling themselves out of rubble, those first courageous trade unionists who had the courage to reestablish their organizations desperately deserved help. And much of the first help that went to them, from the AFL even, was legitimate, was proper, was humanitarian. You know, you send care packages and you give mimeograph machines and so on. When it went beyond that, and became a matter of twisting their arm and saying, look now, you know, you're dependent on our help. You've got to break up the old CGIL organization in Italy. And when they turned to a marvelous human being like Leon Blum, Nobel Prize winner, courageous French resistance hero, and turned to him and against his own better judgment, forced him into breaking with his lifelong ties with the CGT, the Trade Union Federation of France. And when they financed the split in France and Italy, they isolated these heroic figures from the main body of the labor movement and thus destroyed their influence and made them captives of foreign largesse. And nothing will destroy the good name of a national trade union federation than to have it become known that they're dependent upon handouts from the rich uncles in America, especially if the rich uncle in America gets it from the CIA.
Now, the purpose of all these different activities, the political and the uh, front organizations in the different sectors of the population, were to uh, fill this political vacuum that existed after World War II and to fill it with those forces which would be favorable to close relations with the United States, the so-called Atlantic Alliance, and in order to preclude any participation in these organizations and in the national, the political life, by left-wing forces such as the Communist parties. It was to shove them aside and to isolate them so that development of Europe uh, for as many generations as possible could be, uh, could be brought under the control of those forces which are friendliest to the United States and to the interest of our corporations which were moving in part and parcel with the reconstruct reconstruction of Europe after World War II. In um, Washington, D.C., I worked on the Central America desk of the Mexico and Central American countries. That was back in 1957-58. And at that time, well, at first I, I saw it just as information gathering, and then I realized they were really intervening in the affairs of these countries. In this Guatemalan town of Equipulas, just occupied by anti-government forces, are the first evidences of that much-publicized anti-communist revolution. This is headquarters for the once-exiled officers leading the liberation forces. Colonel Miguel Mendoza is district commander under overall rebel chief Colonel Carlos Castillo Armas. Elsa would come home and say things like, well, they're buying votes in Guatemala or words to that effect, you know, and I'd say, well, now, Elsa, you must... You must have got something garbled, you know. The United States government would never do a thing like that. And I couldn't, couldn't believe this. In the nine years, I think I said a thousand times, the, the United States government would never do a thing like that. And then I would find out that, in fact, they had done exactly that. Serious trouble in Tehran, capital of oil-rich Iran. Its pro-Western ruler, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, has lost his throne, temporarily at least. When his army failed to oust the dictatorial-minded Premier Mossadegh, the Shah himself was forced to flee for his life to neighboring Baghdad. Another king without a country. In Rome, where he had fled, 33-year-old Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi hears astounding news. Royalist forces have revolted, arrested Dr. Mossadegh, and want their sovereign home. Army men are given principal credit for the sensational change. When the army turned against its Mossadegh-appointed officers, it assured the return of the king. In 1953, a few CIA people managed to make some changes in, uh, in Iran that President Eisenhower liked very much. In 1954, a few of us in Guatemala made some changes that seemed almost without effort. However, the demands kept growing. Intelligence was asked to do what armies should have been done. It seemed so easy to hope that secret shenanigans could accomplish what an army should have been doing. We were uh, supporting every half-assed dictator, military junta, uh, oligarchy that existed uh, in the third world uh, as long as they promised to somehow maintain the status quo which would of course be beneficial to uh, US uh, uh, geopolitical interests uh, military interests big business interests and other uh, special interests In front of the presidential palace in Havana, and it seems as far as the eye can see, Cubans. Upwards of a million, five-sixths the population of this capital city. Nearly one out of every six persons on the island. Why are they here? Fidel Castro asked them. Graduate lawyer, Dr. Castro displays an eloquence and personal dynamism that completely sways the enormous throng. I felt that we were grossly mishandling the uh, national liberation movement and the emergence of national liberation leaders like Sukarno, Nasser, and Krumah, and so forth throughout the world. I did not believe that we should be trying to overthrow these people or assassinate these people. 
but instead that we should have worked with them. The ailing premier of Cuba, Fidel Castro, emerges from his convalescence to address a youth congress and to announce that Cuba is expropriating United States-owned property in that country. The name is chiseled from the telephone building and signs torn down from this and other properties worth nearly a billion dollars. At the White House, Presidential News Secretary Haggerty announces a break in diplomatic relations with Cuba. There is a limit to what the United States in self-respect can endure. That limit has now been reached. I am to this day absolutely convinced that uh, we drove Fidel Castro into the arms of the Russian bear because uh, he was uh, frightened that we were going to murder him uh, and destroy his new Cuba, and he was absolutely right. A French cargo ship, La Coubre, which had just docked with 76 tons of arms and ammunition for the Revolutionary Army, blew up as hundreds of workers unloaded the cargo. Seventy are dead and over 300 wounded. Government sources have indicated that there is every reason to suspect sabotage. The way it would start is maybe an ambassador, maybe a CIA officer, maybe somebody here in Washington, maybe somebody in the White House would suggest it would be a good idea to help a certain group in another country. That would be looked at to see if we have the contacts, uh, who reliable people we could deal with, and a plan would be put together as to how this would be done. That plan would then be approved within CIA as sensible, would then be submitted to an interagency group and then submitted to the president for final okay. Uh, if the president's approval, then the agency would go ahead. Forty-six were wounded, two killed under questionable circumstances. Castro, in a broadcast speech lasting most of the night, says bombs from U.S.-based planes are responsible for the casualties. Other reports say it was men in cars. Whatever his reasons, Castro stirs strong feelings of anger against the United States. One of the operations they had was to burn the cane fields. As I understand the way it was done, they had people in frogman suits. They would take them out to the coast of Cuba, jump into the water with incendiary devices in their frogman outfits, come up on the beach, plant these incendiary devices in the cane fields, and swim back to the boat. They'd take off, and 10, 15 minutes later, the incendiary device would go off, and it'd start a big fire in the cane field. Fidel señala que al sur de la provincia de Pinar del Río. Fidel indicates that in the south, in Pinar del Rio province, our radar detected a large ship launching smaller craft. The CIA is in direct control of these operations. It is the CIA which has been organizing the attacks, the infiltration of saboteurs, arms, and explosives. The CIA has been doing all this through people it has directly recruited. Uh, has a decision been reached uh, on how far this country would be willing to go in uh, helping an anti-Castro uh, uprising or invasion in Cuba? Well, first I want to say that there will not be under any conditions be an intervention in Cuba by United States Armed Forces. And this government will do everything it possibly can, and I think it can meet its responsibilities to make sure that there are no Americans involved in any action inside Cuba. There's no question that American presidents have found it convenient to make an operation secret, because that way uh, it obviates the necessity for public debate. In many cases, it's obvi obviated the necessity for any sort of discussion in the Congress. Indeed, that's what led to the fiasco of the Bay of Pigs. Gee, we have another big one to do, and we'll keep it secret, too, when it couldn't be kept secret. Cuban revolutionary troops such as these have invaded Castro's leftist island fortress, reportedly rallied by a mysterious coded radio message. Alert, alert, look well at the rainbow. The fish will be running very soon. From the sea and by parachute, the rebels have struck along the coast within 90 miles of Havana. Initial accounts of the fighting sketchy, but strafing and bombing of communications and military targets reported with heavy casualties. 
Meanwhile, in Havana, acting Foreign Minister Olivares shows foreign envoys and newsmen scorched fragments of what may have been rockets fired during the B-26 raids. As might be expected, he points an accusing finger at the U.S. The same line is followed at a dramatic meeting of the United Nations General Assembly's political committee by Cuban Foreign Minister Raul Roa. Charging his nation has been invaded by what he terms mercenaries from Guatemala and Florida. Guatemala y de la Florida. Quickly, forcefully, the charges are denied by Chief U.S. Delegate Adley E. Stevenson. These charges are totally false, and I deny them categorically. The United States has committed no aggression against Cuba and no offensive has been launched from Florida or from any other part of the United States. I had been stationed in Cuba on two occasions, in 1955 and 1956. Then I returned um, in 1959, 58, I was there 59 and 60 before I had to leave rather abruptly. I had an affinity for Cuba. The Cuban people are marvelous. Um, I'd seen what was going on there. And many of the participants in the Bay of Pigs were on that landing force because I had known them personally in Cuba. And I had recommended on a number of occasions that such and such a person would be a good uh, man to have in the brigade. So uh, when that broadcast came from the beach and the leader said, we're standing in the water and there's nothing else we can do. And he cursed. He cursed us. I felt he was cursing me too. Tragic epilogue to a gallant venture. Outside the Miami headquarters of the Cuban Revolutionary Front, exiled wives and mothers seek word of the men who participated in the ill-starred liberation invasion. For most, no news is bitter news, especially as in Havana, Fidel Castro in a four-hour television harangue shouts death for all 700 captives he claims taken in the abortive landing. Miles away in the serenity of Camp David, President Kennedy and former President Eisenhower confer on the repercussions of the Cuban episode. General Eisenhower promises bipartisan support for the president in this crisis as the president moves to the next round of the unceasing east-west power struggle over Cuba. I've said uh, as much as uh, I feel can be usefully said by me in regard to the events of the past few days. Further statements, uh, detailed uh, discussions are uh, not to uh, conceal responsibility because I'm the responsible officer of the government, but merely because I, uh, and that is quite obvious, but merely because I do not uh, believe that uh, such a discussion uh, would benefit us during uh, the present uh, difficult uh, situation. Secretary gave us a crisp uh, clinical analysis uh, of the death of the Cuban venture. But of course, uh, no post-mortem can revive a corpse. When the Bay of Pigs failed, um, I was sitting in the building on that night that everyone knew it was a failure, and Robert Kennedy came in in his shirt sleeves, and he had been sent there by his brother to clean that place out. He wanted to find out what had gone wrong and do something about it. The result, however, was that Bobby Kennedy fell in love with the concept of clandestine operations. And we now know there is one question that's not been answered. Did President Kennedy and did Bobby Kennedy know that there were assassination plans against Fidel Castro? It's an unanswered question. The one thing that I'm absolutely sure of is that not only they knew, but they wished uh, for the continuance of that long period after the Bay of Pigs, in which there were many actions taken against Cuba. To put it precisely, there was at one point when Bobby Kennedy said, when are you fellows going to get off your bottoms and do something about Fidel Castro? There were found some uh, 
a, a suit, a wetsuit, uh, a uh, clamshell, various things that were on the shelf in the agency that were regarded as things that might be used in uh, possibly killing Castro or being used against him, which never came off the shelf or never used. If that's a plot to have uh, created this, then I will back up and say that then we ought to enumerate every single item that conceivably had to do with the invasions of Cuba, which we were constantly running. Uh, under the government aegis, we had uh, uh, um, task forces that were striking at Cuba constantly. We were attempting to blow up power plants. We were attempting to ruin uh, sugar mills. We were attempting to do all kinds of things during this period. This was a matter of American government policy. This wasn't the CIA. Now, if those things taper over into assassination plots, maybe so. Why didn't you want to tell the Warren Commission, or why didn't you tell the Warren Commission about the efforts to get rid of, of Fidel Castro or to overthrow the Cuban government? But Mr. Dodd, you're singling me out as to why I didn't march up and tell the Warren Commission when these operations against uh, Cuba were known to the Attorney General of the United States, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, the President of the United States himself, although he at that point was dead. I mean, all kinds of people knew about these operations high up in the government. Now, why am I singled out as the fellow that it should have gone up and identified a government operation to get rid of Castro, and it was a government-wide operation supported by the Defense Department, supported by the National Security Council, supported by almost everybody in high position in the government. As far as I ever knew or know now, no one in the White House or at the Cabinet level ever gave any approval of any kind to any CIA effort to assassinate anyone. I told the committee in particular that it is wholly inconsistent with what I know of President Kennedy and his brother Robert, that either of them would ever have given any such order or authorization or consent to anyone through any channel. You were head of the agency during the time when most of these allegations Occurred. What, uh, what did you tell the commission about well, your knowledge of assassination plots? I had no knowledge of it whatsoever. And as you know, uh, I stated that there was feasibility or lack of feasibility. There obviously were discussions of the question of whether such matters had been planned, uh, but uh, I had to plead ignorance because none were brought to my attention, and therefore I knew nothing of them. No president in his right mind is going to say, uh, Dear uh, Director, uh, I hereby order you to assassinate Fidel Castro. Uh, in fact, he will probably do the exact opposite. He will issue what is known in the trade as a non-order or uh, a non-directive. He will say, We have these terrible problems down here in Cuba. And um, it's quite obvious to, to all of us that uh, the key to it is Fidel Castro. Now, if we could just get rid of that person, uh, maybe, uh, maybe we could work out uh, some, some kind of an arrangement. Uh, but, of course, you know, we can't do anything like that. That would be wrong. Um, and uh, so uh, I don't know what we're going to do about it. We're just going to have to make the best of it and plug along. Now, he is saying this, say, at, at, at a luncheon with, uh, with uh, McNamara and Rusk and uh, maybe Helms, say, uh, or McCone, whoever was uh, director at the time, well, went over from McCone to Helms. Uh. Now, these men are astute enough to know that what the president is really telling them is get rid of Castro. But I'm not going to put it in writing, and I've already made a statement for the record that I'm against it. In the event anything ever goes wrong, I'll be able to say, didn't I tell you that would be wrong? Could you uh, tell this committee uh, 
uh, who the individuals were involving mafia chieftains or organized crime figures. As far as I'm aware, in that, on that particular situation, it was uh, William K. Harvey who was in touch with John Roselli, and it was Harvey and Roselli who were attempting to find, if I understood it correctly, some channel from uh, Florida into Havana. Uh, I also understand that there was a question of poison pills which were supposed to be transported to Havana. There was never any evidence that they were ever transported there or ever left the United States. Uh, there was never any evidence that uh, this plot ever left the, uh, the Florida mainland. And uh, if it was an, indeed an assassin flash an assassination plot, it was misadvertised to me because I had understood it was an effort to see if a connection could be made between the uh, Mafia in Florida and the Mafia in Havana. And to the best of my knowledge, the connection never was made. Sometime in 1960, uh, during a period wherein for some previous years I had been doing work for the CIA, I was approached by my project officer who asked me if in connection with a planned invasion in Cuba, I would contact a Mr. John Roselli. We started having meetings in uh, Miami. During one of those meetings in Miami, I was introduced to a Mr. Sam Gold, who subsequently uh, turned out to be uh, Mr. Giancana. In any uh, dirty job, and such as paramilitary activities, uh, uh, assassinations, um, sabotage, uh, and the like, what are known as special ops, uh, Almost invariably, uh, the uh, agency direct involvement of the agency officer, the career officer, ends in the planning stage. And sometimes, uh, even before that, just the policy decision making stage. The dirty work will be carried out by either contract agents or uh, one time agents, uh, gangsters. Uh, uh, mercenaries, whoever happens to, uh, to be available, whatever assets are, uh, are available for at, the, at that moment. We were told it was important in connection with the uh, invasion of Cuba. At that time, to dispose of Mr. Castro and and to the word dispose, you can add uh, anything you want. It is likely that at the very moment President Kennedy was shot, a CIA officer was meeting with a Cuban agent in Paris and giving him an assassination device for use against Castro. Now, I read this, and, uh, and again, I'm reading from the same report uh, that we read from earlier. They're calling it an assassination device. Are we getting semantical here again? I believe it was a hypodermic syringe they'd given him with some something called black leaf number 40 in it. Uh, this was in response to Amlash's request that he be provided uh, some sort of a device whereby he could kill Castro. He returned this device to the case officer. The case officer brought it back to uh, Washington and that was the end of the uh, plot. Okay, but, but for purposes of, of discussion, the officer gave this uh, uh, Cuban, uh, this agent, in Paris, a device with that material you described in it. I presume the material that injected into a human being would kill him. Is that correct? I would think so, yes. So the agent gives the Cuban agent the device to kill somebody. I'm sorry he didn't give him a pistol because it would have made the whole thing a lot simpler and less exotic. Well, whether it's a pistol or a needle, if Amlash is a political plot to destabilize the government, what in the blazes are we giving an agent a device that will kill Castro with for if it's not an assassination plot? Well, if you want to have it that way, why don't you just have it that way? 
Well, I don't want... It's not a question of what I want. Uh, oh, I think it is what you want, Mr. Dodd. Mr. Helms, I'm reading to you from reports here, prepared at your request by the Inspector General. I understand I'm not that. fabricating this or creating well, out of all my... I I'm, understand that. I'm quoting. I understand that. Well, it's, it's not a question of what I want. It's a question of what this committee would like to know, and the committee is is not satisfied, I don't believe at this point, as to exactly what the characterization of Amlash was. Well, I've told you what I believe the ca characterization of Amlash to be. Well, how if does that jive with this? If you want, if because we gave him a gun or a hypodermic syringe or whatever the case may be at his request because he had aims on Castro, if that is your definition of an assassination of plot, then have it that way. That's quite satisfactory with me. But don't you open yourself to blackmail in other words, if you're involved in a covert operation and you're using elements, like for instance the Mafia, in some of the assassination attempts against Castro, isn't that really a, a very dangerous thing to get involved in? You bet it is. It's very, very tricky. Um, the Mafia. Aren't you getting into trouble when you use them during World War II? As we now recently read, we use them in New York City. I had only known that we had used them in Marseille, uh, on the docks there. Of course it's a tricky business. It's a part of the evaluation that a good intelligence officer and a good policymaker will make in deciding whether to use any person or any instrument or any political organization. There's no question. But it's very tricky. In the setup that the agency has, where the dirty work is done by uh, uh, contract people or one-time uh, uh, hirees and so forth, uh, obviously if uh, anything goes wrong, they can be disavowed um, if um, the person uh, turns bad, turns sour, and uh, may uh, want to speak out and may possibly have some credibility and or evidence, well then uh, uh, stronger action is called for and uh, you can have uh, the ultimate termination uh, of the agent. When the police arrived, they found Mr. Gincana laying on the floor, dead, been shot numerous times in the upper part of his body and throat. Approximately six shots believed to be fired from a 22 caliber weapon. Is there anything to support the theory that uh, Gincana's killing may have been in some way uh, connected with his involvement with an alleged CIA plot to assassinate Fidel Castro? We know nothing about that. Uh, we have nothing to lead us to believe that at all. One of the conclusions the Senate came to after eight months of study, one of the conclusions was that no foreign leader had ever been assassinated by CIA. Now, it wasn't for want of trying in Castro's case, of course, but that's the only case in which there was any substantial effort made against one. And yet, I think the world as a whole thinks that CIA was around trying to assassinate everybody, and it's just plain false. Patrice Lumumba comes back to Leopoldville a prisoner. The former Congo premier who was captured when he fled inland no longer wears the tuft of whiskers on his chin that helped to identify him. His arrest provoked several clashes between Lumumba followers and Congolese army troops. But Congo strongman Colonel Joseph Mobuto, shown as he watches Lumumba arrive, says he is prepared to put down any uprising. Mobuto enjoys the sight of Lumumba being tied up more firmly for transfer to the garrison town of Teesville. A soldier tries to stuff into Lumumba's mouth a crumpled speech asserting his claim to power. The former premier shows no emotion. It may be the end of a chapter, but not yet the end of the Congo story. In training, down at uh, Camp Perry at the farm, uh, a CIA officer, middle grade officer at that time, was telling us about his career. And one of the things he threw out to illustrate the adventures you get into was uh, finding yourself in Lubumbashi and the Katanga with Lumumba's body in the back, in the trunk of your car, driving around town trying to figure out what to do with it. One of Mr. Lumumba's weaknesses was his uh, propensity to turn matters over to the Soviet Union. So I would think that uh, his death, unless it results in a kind of martyrdom that might prove useful to the Russians, would be regarded as a blow to their interests. The CIA had developed a program to assassinate Lumumba under De uh, Devlin's encouragement and, 
and uh, management. The, the program they developed, the operation, didn't work. They didn't follow through on it. It was to give uh, poison to Lumumba, and they couldn't find a, a setting in which to, to get the poison to him successfully in a way that it wouldn't appear to be a CIA operation. I mean, you couldn't invite him to a cocktail party and, and uh, give him a drink and have him die a short time later, obviously. And so they gave up on it. Uh, they got cold feet. Uh, and instead, they handled it by the chief of station talking to Mobutu about the threat that Lumumba posed, and Mobutu going out and killing Lumumba, having his men kill Lumumba. And what about the CIA's relationship with Mobutu? Were they paying him money? Yes, indeed. Uh, I was there in 1968 when the chief of station told uh, the story about having been the day before that day, having gone to make a payment to Mobutu of cash, $25,000, and Mobutu saying, keep the money, I don't, uh, I don't need it. Uh, and by, by then, of course, Mobutu's European bank account was so huge that uh, 25000 was nothing to him. The CIA worked through the reactionary forces, essentially, uh, or the, the middle roading or the social democratic forces, whichever ones they're trying to support. They work through these people. In the CIA, there is a, a distinction made between the career U.S. citizen employees, like I was, uh, that is the officers and staff, and the people who actually do the work at the end of the line, uh, who are the agents. An agent um, is a person who is recruited and hired to perform a specific intelligence or covert action task in a particular area at a particular moment in time and so he is or she uh, is an indigenous person one one time in particular the chief of china branch had come to my window to draw funds and he uh, was drawing funds for death benefits for a person by the name of dave who had been sent to china as an agent and he said well we lost another body today and i said well, this seems like a very callous way to talk about a human life. And he said, well, Jim, we can't let our emotions interfere with our operational effectiveness. One of my favorite agents, a charming individual who looked and acted, as a matter of fact, very much like Flip Wilson. He's quite talented and just a pleasure and a delight to be around. Uh, I left the country reassigned, and a, a week or two later, he was uh, uh, executed shot by the police just picked him up and shot him without trial and uh, he would not have been shot if he had not been working for me during this period of time the situation in uh, that an intelligence officer faces when he attempts to get someone to serve the interests of the united states rather than the interests of his own country is precisely the kind of thing that a con man is doing when he's working on the mark the only person who doesn't know what the game is uh, when con men are working is the mark. The only person who really doesn't know what the game is in an intelligence recruitment is the target of that recruitment. Some of the jobs of intelligence are one which can best be performed by people who are themselves a little devious uh, so they can get at the root of the matter. Um, if you wanted to invite a dozen people to spend the rest of your life with you on a desert island, I wouldn't suggest that you invite a bunch of spies. But I believe someone has to do intelligence work, so I did it. That's the end of the first in our three-part series featuring the award-winning documentary On Company Business. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, Austin, Texas. Goodbye. The CIA's on company business all through Latin America. Maybe in Ecuador, and maybe in Argentina, and maybe in Brazil.